gospel to basically to, the, to Chinese around the world. But uh, his work, he's working right now, is in um, Mexico, in one of the biggest cities in the world. I think after around I mean, it's either Beijing or Mexico City. Because Mexico City is an enormous place. And he's working in Mexico, uh, planting churches. Uh, part of a group that's planting churches in, in that uh, area for uh, those that are uh, from, from China or for the Chinese in, that, uh, in Mexico. I was sort of caught off guard. I, I always think of uh, the U.S. and Canada as places where they where we were doing that. I would never think of Mexico. Uh, part, of, part of North America being a place where um, we would need Chinese churches, but I don't know why in my head I thought that. But, uh, but apparently, in my mind, I, I couldn't see anybody going to Mexico, I guess, in some ways, for some reason. But anyhow, that being said, uh, we do. We also, at Southern Baptist, have missionaries also in, in Mexico, working in Mexico City, and actually one of, one of the, our missionaries is rated, from Canada is in Mexico City as well. Her name is Anne. Uh, but anyway, anyhow, I'm going to just read for uh, the text this morning, which is found in, in the book of Acts. I don't know why I'm so nervous this morning. I feel like I'm nervous. But uh, it's maybe because I don't get enough preaching. I'm, I'm more nervous. But uh, anyhow, but it's in, in the book of Acts, but we're looking at the first chapter, beginning in verse 6 through to well, four, verse 14. This is another passage. We noticed this morning uh, the passages that we, read, we did read this morning already in our worship time are from the, are in Matthew's we consider the Great Commission, and then in Mark also. Well, this is also considered part of the Great Commission. It's, uh, it's, it's one of those passages I, I actually prefer as far as looking at the Great Commission and how it, how it uh, describes our, our task. But well, let's read there. It says, So when they had come together, they asked the Lord, at this time, are you restoring the kingdom of it to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the time or period that the Father has sent, uh, set by, by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he, he said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud receives him, and out of and a cloud received them out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus who you have taken from you, who, who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from, from the Mount of Calvalo which is near Jerusalem, at a Sabbath day to journey away. When they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Elphias, Simon, the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these were continually united in prayer, along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, this time, I'm just going to invite our pastor to come and to share with us what God has given him to share to this morning. So today, it's a little different, I guess. The big guy is not preaching, the little guy is preaching there. Yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> Nice to be here this morning. Praise the Lord that I can be here and thank uh, your church for giving me this opportunity to come and share with you uh, from Max, from chapter 1. Uh, and also to share with you actually some of my experience in South America. I work in South America. Actually, I've been working in South America for a number of years already. Uh, my son, uh, my, my eldest son, my son was born in Panama actually. Uh, so he was born in Panama back in uh, not too long ago. 1983, actually. Yeah, it's about 20-something years ago, almost like. Uh, and uh, my two girls uh, were born in Canada, in Toronto and in Windsor. So they came afterwards, of course. Right now, they're all in Toronto. My, my two girls just graduated from university in Toronto. And uh, one of 
them is continuing on to the special ed thing. The other one is looking for uh, looking for a job right now. She studied actually international development, so it's not really business type stuff. It's uh, working with NGO, helping poor countries. And so she, at this point, she landed a job. She has a job in uh, in, uh, in Ecuador, in Quito, in Ecuador. She might reject it and go to Africa instead and do something else in Africa. She went to Africa last year and did something in Africa, so that's why. Uh, my son actually is a little more interesting. He's actually working a cruise right now. He's working on Royal Caribbean, so he's working a cruise right now. And uh, doing some children and youth stuff you know, in, in the cruise. So uh, that's sort of like my family at this point. My wife, uh, yesterday she went back. We were in Toronto for her week last week and my wife she went back to Mexico yesterday uh, yesterday morning so she arrived safely we communicated last night she's in Mexico right now and I'm here I guess that's how just a little bit of introduction as to our life and what's going on uh, that's how we have a word of prayer here. Father we come to you uh, in worship praising you and thanking you for the great things that you did Sending Jesus as Savior, sending Jesus into this world, dying on the cross for our sin, making sure that salvation uh, it's complete, making sure that salvation uh, it's through Jesus Christ. And we just praise you and thank you for it. Praise you and thank you that we can be here together to worship you, to praise you, and to uh, dig into your words, to understand what you want us to do. To understand what are your will, what's your will for our lives, for the church, for all of us living in this world at this point in time. Praise you and thank you, and I saw this in Jesus' name, Christ and we pray. Amen. Uh, I want to begin with a little story. I came to Canada actually in 1973, so it's a number of years ago, uh, in Vancouver. And when I first came, I remember I think it was the first. I think it was about the first or second week in Vancouver. My sister, my sister and my brother, they were already here. So my sister and my brother, they took me to, uh, to a hamburger joint, hamburger place. It's one of those A&W, I don't know if it's existed anymore nowadays, you know. So back in the 70s, you know, we went to, to uh, A&W and had hamburgers. So was, back in those days, it was still almost like the last, almost like the last part of Almost like the last, how should I put it? At the very end of that era, we can almost say that you know, we, I, she was driving a Mustang, so the three of us, because my brother in law, four of us, were in this Mustang together, kind of with this AW with park, and then that's what we did. But those, in those days, you roll down the window, you know, the waitress the, the, would come, you know, with the tray in hand and the roller skates, and then we would order, you know, afterwards, then the, the hamburgers would come on the tray that would be to the window and so we would have our hamburger in the car that's sort of like you know, back in those days you know so a couple of years ago I took my kids you know, uh, back when we were in Toronto when we were in Vancouver I took my kids uh, uh, to find this A&W that I had hamburgers many years ago uh, it was around you know Vancouver around it was around something like around Fraser and 25th Avenue somewhere around in that area and to my surprise, and in a sense, not to my surprise as well, I couldn't find this place. It was folded. So, drove around a couple of blocks, you know, couldn't find a place. So, of course, we went somewhere else and went to this interesting place called McDonald's, you know, with the big M. You know, so we went to McDonald's instead. You know, you know McDonald's is a very interesting place, you gotta realize. You know, McDonald's, uh, you know, in McDonald's, you know, anywhere you go in McDonald's, I mean, any country that you go to, uh, when you go to McDonald's, everything, you never realize that everything is the same. You never realize that even the wrapper, even the little ketchup, of course in Mexico, you go there, there, there are other little packages as well, jalapeno and, and uh, salsa verde, different types of sauce as well, but you know, basically uh, everything is the same. I call it, you know, the 50 year no change hamburger. It's just like, like they say in Hong Kong, but you know, the hamburger never changes. 
always, always the same. Remember where you go, Peking, you go to Venezuela, you go to Mexico, you go to Canada, anywhere as well. The hamburger always is on exactly the same. Now the point, my point is, why is that there are some hamburger places like McDonald's that you know, it seems like they, they would never go bankrupt in a sense. They would never fold. And then there are some little places, even A and W. You know, eventually they fold it bankrupt and then finish. Why is it it's like that? What is the difference anyway? Both the hamburgers are the same. Piece of meat, two pieces of bread, plus some lettuce, something in between. If you go to South America, they would sometimes not only add cheese to it, they would add a fried egg to it too, because it's the norm sort of like. So, but basically, it's always the same. You know, preaching the gospel, there are some similarities. The gospel never changes, and of course, should not be changed. But the thing is, the presentation of the gospel, the manifestation of the gospel, always and always just keeps on changing. Every generation is responsible to preach the same old gospel to its generation. I preach the same old gospel to my generation, in my language. You preach the same gospel, the same old gospel to your generation, but in a different presentation. The rapping can be different, but the content inside remains the same and never and should not be changed. In this critical moment of history, you and I, you and I are the one that God has chosen to bring the gospel to our own generation. I bring the gospel to my generation, you bring your gospel to your generation. In different manner, in different ways, but the same old gospel. The thing about Acts is that it's very interesting. You know, we read Acts because we have, the, we have the whole New Testament with us. It doesn't matter. You have the PowerPoint to show it. If you don't have the PowerPoint, it's just the same. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the thing about Acts is that Acts is a little story. If you read Acts, Acts is history, of course, but you know, you read history in the sense of like a story. So you read chapter one, and then you go into chapter two, and yeah, I put the Chinese and the English together, so like, it's a little compact, I guess. Yeah, basically what I said this morning, you know, it's all summarizing there too, in a sense, you know, so. Um, the thing about Acts is that, like I said, it's a history, but then we can read it sort of like a story. And the funny thing is that, you know, we have chapter 1 and we have chapter 2. So when we finish chapter 1, of course, naturally, we go to chapter 2, and then from chapter 2, we go to chapter 3, and sort of like, oh, yeah, it's just basically when, just like that, it seems like. But what I want you to do today is that try to focus not only uh, in Acts, but in Acts chapter 1, just think that putting yourself in chapter 1 without chapter 2. Putting all of us into the shoes of the disciples. Chapter 1. And chapter 1 only. And only from verse 6 to 14. Not imagine that you don't know what's going to happen afterwards. So this is in a sense a new beginning. Every generation has a new beginning. Every church has a new beginning. Next year, now it's October, so most likely your pastor is planning for next year, or what's going to be the big plan for next year. Every year is a new beginning. Every year, we begin chapter 1 of the book of Acts again. Now, what is it going to be like in chapter 2? So, just all of us focus into this part of scripture, 
and just put us into the shoes of the disciples. So my main two points already up there. Just get the whole thing as a man. Well, yeah, it's okay, no worry. And many years ago when I was in Venezuela, I, I, I worked in actually I in South America. My son was born in South America. So afterwards I went and I uh, did my language study in Bolivia. I spent about six years in, in, in Bolivia and ten years in Venezuela. In the ten years when I was in Venezuela, in Chinese church there, it was after the third year of almost like I think, yeah, something like after the third year. So I was able to ask some of my leaders, you know, I said, uh, uh, I've been here about three years now. You know, so what do you think of my preaching? And do you understand? And then some honest word came from them. He said, you know, Pastor, three years now we have been here. We couldn't even understand a word of your preaching. That's the honest word. And they said to me, I mean, he said, you know, it's too long. For one thing, too many points. Another thing, and at times, too boring. <laughs> Honest words. So after that, I changed all my sermons. Only two points. No three points, sir. So only two points. And then from that two points, I would usually have one or two points smack in between in there. Sometimes. <laughs> so basically, my two points today is that all of us put ourselves into chapter one of Acts. Put all our all of us into the shoes of the disciples and think of just two things. The feelings of the disciple at that point in chapter 1, in this part. And then afterwards, the action. What did they do after this? So what do you think? Chapter 1 of the Acts of the Apostles. The question that they ask. Do you think they still remember the great commission, you know, what Jesus has commissioned them to do, to go and preach and, and teach and all that? Do you think they still remember all that? What was in their mind at, at, at this point? You know, Jesus, the commandment was to okay, go and preach and bring the gospel to, to the end of the world and, and be testimony for me and, and different things, you know. Uh, do you think they still remember all this? To go to be assertive, to take a proactive approach. Don't wait for them to come. You go, go to them. Bring the gospel to them and to teach them. You know, evangelism is a form of teaching as well. Some people, they reject Christianity because they just don't know what Christianity is all about. They don't, they cannot accept Jesus because some of them have never heard about Jesus before in their life. I have met people like that. There are people who really have not heard of Jesus before. And I would ask them a simple question. Like, you know, really, uh, this year right now, we are in uh, 2009, right? 2009. Who really decides on 2009? I mean, what, what's, what factor or, or who decides on, on, on what happened to 2009? Basically, of course, the birth of Jesus is 0, 0, 0, 0 year, right? Just the first year or zero year, sort of like. And so basically, some people do not know about things like this. In Chinese news, it's interesting, my name, you know, like, uh, in, you know, in, in Chinese culture, they always call me Law Xi. My, 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 my last name is Law, actually, or in Law in Chinese, or whatever. But, uh, yeah, but my name in Chinese is Law Xi. Now, Mok Xi actually is reverend or pastor, okay? So, and then some people would ask me, uh, so what do we call you? What do you mean, what do you call me? Everybody call me Long Xi, right? Oh, they thought that Bok Xi is my name. So should I call you Bok Ga or Xi in Chinese? This is kind of difficult to translate, you know. But, but that's what I mean. There are some people really in this world came from China and have no idea what the Bible is like, no idea who Jesus is. And even if you say, oh, why Long Xi? I am Pastor Long. And they would say, actually, you know the word Pastor? In Spanish, it's a name. Well, it's a pastor, it's a pastor too, but it's a name as well. And so they would ask me, Lord Moxi, so uh, how, what, what should we call you then in that case? You know, uh, there are people like this in this world. And then to go to teach and to, uh, to baptize them, to baptize them in the name of the Father, to bring them into the church, join the church. You know all of this. Do you know? Do you think they would still remember all this? 
you know, they would have the courage, they would have to decide, yes, we should go because Jesus commanded us, our master commanded us, so we should go. Okay? But naturally, even if they have that in mind, naturally it would come to mind that, so where? So who? So how? Of course, all this would come to mind. And it's funny that they ask this question as well in uh, verse 6. First thing that they ask about Jesus before he was before he sent in uh, So they met together and they asked him, the Lord, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? You know, they were slaves, they were ruled by the Romans. At that point, the country was in a sense in ruin. And it's natural. They would always go back. Oh yeah, if we were, you know, if just so that we were back in the days of Solomon, back in the days of David, back in the days of Saul, that would be great. That was when the, when Israel, when our country was really the greatest at that point. People would come to us, bring stuff to us and all that. We were a great nation at that point. We were a great country at that point. So if we were anything were to happen. If we were to just, Jesus, help us, help us, restore us, transform us, back into those days, man, that would be just great. That would be awesome. And so, the disciples were thinking of like this. Israel, I mean, it's nothing wrong, okay, but they were thinking like this. Jesus was thinking, Their eyes were focused on Israel, on themselves. Jesus, his perspective was to the end of the world. You know, the Israel, I mean, the Jews are the chosen race, so they are very special, they're very ex exclusive, you know, so that's why all of us are Gentiles, and only they are the chosen race. The rest of the world, anyone of us in this world, Gentiles. Outside us, that's natural. We Chinese think like that too, you know. Because in when I was in Hong Kong, when I when I when, when I was in high school and, and did my history in English, uh, actually China is China, of course. But China in Chinese is called Zhongguo, right? You know, you're Chinese. You go to Chinese school and do your Chinese school stuff, you know. Then you know Chinese school. Then China is Zhongguo. What is Zhongguo? Go is what? Go is country. What is Zhou? Middle. Or what? Central. Zhong Go is what? Zhong Go is the central kingdom. The rest of the world revolves what? All around us. We are the central kingdom. That's why we are called Zhong Go. The rest barbarians. Yes, in this world. The rest, they are all barbarians. Only we are the civilized one. Only we are what? We are China. We are Zhongguo. We are the central kingdom. We are the center of the world. The rest, nothing. We are Zhongguo. That's what Zhongguo means. That's what China means. We are exclusive too. All of us, all cultures are exclusive. So there is this, you can almost sense that there is this big gap, this disparity that's going somewhere right in the middle. Jesus has big things in mind, preaching the gospel to the end of the world. The disciple had something else in mind, Israel, the Jews, our own country. You know, they were thinking like this. Historically, culturally, religiously, they were carrying their own baggage. <coughs> History, culture, religion, everything, they're carrying it on, on their back. And it's not simple, yes, it's not simple to get rid of. So, what do you think? What would be the feeling of the disciple? Does it look dim, bleak, depressing? The disciple would be talking about themselves, what should we do, so what should we do, where should we go, how should we do all this stuff. 
that Jesus had commanded us. You know, it's funny in, in, in Acts, especially the first part here, there's no answer really to all this. And then the answer came in uh, verse 12, basically the last few verses. Basically, what ended up was that, uh, led by the Spirit, was that they all came together and they prayed. It, there's nothing that's mentioned in there about how they prayed, what they prayed for, what they afraid, they were scared, they knew what to do, but it's just basically that they all came together constantly in one accord, in unity, and they all came together and they prayed. Simple answer to a solution, yes, in a sense. They may not know what to do, yes, they know what to do, but they all came together and they pray. They all came together and they pray constantly. And they all came together and they pray unceasingly. They came together and they pray. The scripture did say that all they came together and they, so they had a big meeting that we all do in here and we sat down and we plan out, okay, what's the next step? So what will be the details of the next step? So what will the logistic be for the next step and things like that? Nothing. They all came together and they prayed. They all came together in unity and they prayed. And what happened? We can go to the next slide just to speed things up. So they all came together and prayed. So now I'm going to do it. Oh, yeah, this is another part. Too. Yes. This is a very powerful passage, actually. I have no time for this. This is a very powerful passage. Because it's extraordinary. Can you imagine if you see somebody, if you see me, you know, if I have a little rocket behind me and I suddenly shoot up like this, you know? <laughs> Whoa! You know, this passage is something else, you know? Think what happened to Jesus. Cloud came down, took him up. Power of commission being sent out. The one being sent out, not just like that, but with power, with commission. But we have no time for this. Just go on to the next one. Okay. This is the last one. This is the part. Yes. Yeah, this is the part. Very quick Bible study together. Very simple Bible study. What happened when they prayed? Basically in Acts, we can sense, we can see three breakthroughs in three levels of the early church. Chapter 2, verse 42. Chapter 2, verse 30, uh, 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. That's the early church. That's the essence of the early church. They all came together. And they all came together to pray, to fellowship, to teaching and to the breaking of bread, worship and to prayer. You know, all churches have different ways of putting this, you know, it's the four, uh, what's the new word now? The four, I forgot the church that we use in Toronto. So there are four or big, four or five big things that we do in the church. Yeah, what are the four big things? Oh yeah, we fellowship, we worship, uh, so we do teaching and do, we do evangelism. It's always the same couple of things actually, but always put in different ways, that's all. And so they all came together. The believers, they all came together to worship, to the teaching of the word, to building up one another, to communion, to prayer. The vitality of the church actually depends on the vitality of each one of us, of its own members. The strength of the church, it's the strength of what? Of its member. If you are strong, the church will be strong. If you are weak, the church will be weak. I think it was Eugene Peterson who once said that uh, if you accept the word of God, you accept the pain that comes along with the word of God. 
What it means is that the Word of God came to us, you and I, like a two-edged sword, poke into my heart, change me. To be honest, in the past time, to be honest too, I don't want to change. Right? Yeah. None of us want to change. I don't want to change. But receiving the Word of God means receiving the pain, accepting the pain that comes with receiving the Word. Honestly and truthfully, change that comes into my life. And that's what happened in the level of the believers. The next level it's from uh, chapter 10, chapter 11 is a long passage, you don't have to read that. Two, you got to realize there are 28 chapters in the book of Acts. Two chapters devoted to Peter. Just to break him down, sort of like. Two chapters. Just to what? Just to change his mentality. That the gospel is not only for the Jews, for the Israelites. The gospel is what? The gospel is open for wrong. The level of the leaders. If the leadership in the church, if the mentality is like this, the church is spreading, the mentality is like this. If the leadership thinks like this, the church thinks like this. If the leadership, just think of the four walls of the church, the brethren, the church itself will think of what of the four walls of the church. It is as simple as that. So that's why pray for your leadership. Pray that God will give them wisdom, that God will give them vision, insights. Vision, not only for the church, vision for the world, for what God is doing in this world. Because if your leaders think narrowly, all of you will think and act narrowly as well. The last part, the great chapter 13, the first few verses. So sending out Paul and Silas, two members of the leadership team of the Antioch Church. And then from chapter 13 onwards, on, bringing the gospel to Chia, to Judea, to all parts of the world. Through prayer in the early church and in, in the book of Acts, we could easily pick up the three levels of breakthrough. I just want to finish this sermon uh, today with uh, a little testimony. Uh, I can show little pictures here as well. Uh, I was in Venezuela for about 10 years and uh, we, have two, we have two churches, uh, one in Caracas in the capital and then one in Pakistineto uh, outside about five hours away. And then when I was working in the church in Pakistineto, uh, a church in Akariwa, this little place, just push it once more, to see it. Yeah, this little place called Akariwa, uh, about one hour away from Pakistineto, where, where we have another church. Uh, you gotta imagine this little place again. Little means really little. Okay? It's not a big city like Edmonton or anything like that. It's one of those small towns. Okay? So, right? And uh, this, the pastor from the church, the Leadership from the church invited us to their church uh, and asked us uh, to do a sort of evangelistic campaign for them because there were some Chinese uh, in that in that little city and so we went there. So we went to this church. This church is not like yours. It's a very nice church, very beautiful church. From my point of view, it's a very beautiful church. You know, benches and everything. You can imagine a little church right behind the market. You know, so it's not paved. There's no carpet, of course. Uh, it's not paved, there's no tiles, so the benches are not like yours, it's little dumpy little benches, you know, and all that. And uh, a little great church, you know. And uh, when I went to the church, I saw in the bulletin board, there was this bulletin board at the back there, and saw this bulletin board, they have this huge sort of little cardboard in there, and then little, little cardboard, there were, if I remember right, uh, my memory serves me right, there were about 12 pictures, 12 photos, what I mean. Well, photos uh, in the little you know, bulletin board, and then underneath each photo there were three lines. So I saw some names, some people signing their name, and so I asked the leadership, you know, so what, what's it all about? 
and they explained to me was that uh, before they invited, invited us to do this evangelistic campaign with them, one uh, half a year to a year before, they went and took some pictures about 12 shops, Chinese shops, you know, in the in the city in Nakariwa, and then they put this up and they asked people to sign up to pray for, you know, if you sign up for this shop, you know, then you pray for this shop, pray for the people, pray for the lead, uh, pray for the owners. I mean, uh, you know, they this is a Spanish church; they don't speak any Chinese at all, of course, you know, and so they they, they just said, you know, just just pray for. Them. Pray for them, pray for them, pray for them. But not only just pray for them. You, you, when you sign up as well, then you don't go to anywhere else to buy your stuff. Most of them are supermarkets, you know, little supermarkets. So you don't go anywhere else to buy your grocery. You go to that place. And you try to make, build some, some bridges, you might make some relationships with them. So all this happened uh, before we, we went to this uh, little church. And just to make the long story short, just to show the other slides as well. So our church uh, cancelled the service for that day and then we rented a bus and then the whole church went there. Oh, in Chinese it's called, it's, uh, actually it's Funying, it's uh, welcome and we have free movies. You know, it, was, it was actually, we didn't really do a movie at all, but they just wrote down free movies, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and then next time, uh, what we did was that we had a little campaign, so the young people did a skit and we did some singing and I did the preaching uh, and so just to make a long story short, you know, so we had this little evangelistic campaign uh, in the Chinese Association. Well, almost like about 50, 60 people came, you know, and uh, the end result was that about 12 people, 12 of them, made professional faith. Now, I want you all to go home, not with the idea that because we did it, the young people did a great skit, and I did my preaching, it was good preaching, and I can tell you none of this, none of this. What happened, and all of our leadership afterwards, we evaluated, and uh, basically the idea and the result was that, yeah, we did a play, it was okay. I did my preaching, it was okay. We did the singing and all that, and it was okay. Twelve people came to know the Lord, not because we went there. Twelve people came to know the Lord because what? Because they all prayed for them. Because this church, before they invited us, they prayed for them. They prayed for these people in these twelve shops. Now, I don't know if they exactly came from these twelve shops or not, I don't know. But all this happened because what? Because this Spanish church that doesn't speak, and none of them could speak any Cantonese or speak any Mandarin or any Chinese at all. They had the desire, they had the heart for preaching the gospel, for bringing the gospel to the Chinese community. They didn't know what to do, but they know one thing. They know to go to pray. And they pray for them for half a year to about one year before they invited us. We did an okay job, normal stuff. Twelve people came to know the Lord because what? Because of their prayer. Because of their desire to bring the gospel to the Chinese community. Prayer, it's the ingredients of mission. If the church were to be involved in mission here, in Edmonton or overseas or anywhere else, it all begins with what? With prayer. And if we, if we don't gather together to pray, nothing, nothing will happen. We could have all the resources in this world to do, oh yeah, this and that and this and that. Nothing will come out. Pray. It's one thing that talk disciples to their knees. It also brought the church forward because of what? Because of prayer.